is there a theology that deals with the issue of promises, particularly on whether there are circumstances when it's legitimate to break a promise? Thank you very much. First, I would rather say, before we go into the theological synthesis, let us look at the man himself, the woman, the atropos. The human person is, should be able to defend his or her dignity. You know, the ancient Greek, the philosophy, they categorize human beings into theory in the societies. The first category of human beings is the idiot. The second is the citizen. Right. And the other one is the tribe. You have the tribe, the second one, and the citizen, the third one. The idiot is the person who does not care about others. He's egocentric. He only thinks about himself. Right. Whatever. Is that the political class then? Yeah, <laughs> I to, I to put that one in. Whereas the tribe thinks about himself and the tribe mm. is relative, everything that, you know. And the citizen is the one who thinks of the common goods. For you to be able to tell the truth, to make a promise and keep it, you have to be a citizen. That means you have the welfare of the common good. Right. So talking about making promises or breaking them, it depends on why do you make promises? To whom do you make promise? And how do you intend to fulfill that promise? Yeah, but does it depend so, on why you make a promise? Because the whole point is that if you make a promise, you would have considered the implications of making that promise, and therefore the expectation will be that you will fulfill your promise. If you are a citizen, it is expected that you want to fulfill your promise so as to defend your integrity. Right. But if you are just the selfish type, the idiot, you will just make any promise because you are looking for votes. Right. Not because you want to help the people. But I would like to let you know that many of our, you know, of our human beings, for politicians, even teachers all over, sometimes they make these promises for, to get you to themselves mm. so that they can exploit you. So that they can become manipulated, manipulated uh, at us. So once you're able to, they manipulate you, then you serve their ego, you serve their pocket, and you serve their pride. Okay, let me bring in Sesu Akume there, because <clears throat> you're the one who's wearing the closest thing to a political hat here. Um, what, in your assessment, are the principles at stake when promises are broken, particularly by politicians? The principles... I, I find this a bit difficult to, to explain and express because I would like us to situate it in Nigeria, for mm. instance. Yeah, of course. You can in, use in, any example. So in, in Nigeria, I don't know how to answer that question because our politics is not based on principles in the first place. So it's difficult to explain. Mm. When the priest is talking about the integrity of the person saying it, many people who are running for office don't have any integrity. And so do most of us who do the voting too. So integrity is just another word that we abuse. Mm. So it's difficult to explain what is at stake. But generally, if we're people of honor and people of integrity and of principle and are people who want to do things properly and to lift up our society, then you know that when you make a promise, it comes with a baggage. The baggage is to fulfill it because mm. you made a promise. But here we are, we make promises that we have no intention of fulfilling in the first place. This other side of it is even the electorate know that the person telling those promises is lying, and yet they go ahead and incentivize the lying. It gets very m more complex when we come to our Nigerian situation. Well, we're going to get more into particular situations Indeed. and the Nigeria. I'm just trying Indeed. to establish the general but, but principles generally, generally, around it. In generally, mm. generally, a promise made should be keep, kept. If you know you cannot do something, it's best to say mm. you stay within the limit of what you can do. But in the worst case scenario, like you asked earlier, are there circumstances whereby a promise can be broken? In a situation where a promise cannot be kept, then first and foremost, the person who made the promise should acknowledge that I did make this promise. Right. But for so and so and so and so circumstances that I am unable to, to counter, 
I'm not able to do this, but mm. in the absence of doing this, this is what I'm able to do. Then you know that the promise, even though it was not kept, it wasn't a lie. But in the, abs in the absence of that, whereby we make promises without doing that, then we're doing politics and running our society without principles at all. Sure. It leads only to chaos. That, that's a good point. And let me bring you in, uh, Dr. Adeni. Um, and I'm not trying to turn you into a religious sort of person. I don't know what your religion is, because he's the religious person <laughs> here. But just to try to establish the principles, yeah. there is quite a lot of theology in Christianity, in Islam, in Judaism, about principles that go with breaking and making promises. I mean, if you look at the covenants yeah. in the holy books, they're all about God making promises right. uh, which last through time, and those promises are fundamental to the whole of theology, are they not? Yeah, yeah, very well, but there's a whole lot of difference between precepts, between, mm. between theory and practice, between ideation and reality, and that's what we're seeing. The religious books are quite clear on the need for us to um, be truthful, the need for us to be honest, mm. you know, but it has been the challenge of man, you know, um, to keep to the prescriptions of the holy books, you know. That's a, a perpetual challenge, and that's why we have uh, Christians going to churches, to the church on Sunday, have Muslims going to the mosque on Friday, so that we can be reminded of right. the precepts of the holy books. So it's a challenge that will continue, and it's been with us, but the, uh, the fact that the, the challenge is, the more we're able to deal with it, the more we're able to rise above, above it, the more we'll say, that we are living according to the dictates of the Almighty. But having said that, when I saw this topic, it reminded me of what Nikita Khrushchev said uh, those days. When Nikita was saying, Khrushchev was a former leader in the Soviet, the very, old Soviet Union. Absolutely, right. very well. You know, and he said that politicians are people that will promise to build bridge even where there's no river. But that's understandable, the context of the time. But in modern times, really, we cannot really say that politicians are deceptive, politicians are lying, because lying is an art, you know, that is, a, that is common with human beings. Mm. Hardly would you see somebody who does not tell a lie. And hardly would you, if you put it in another way, hardly would you see somebody who is absolutely truthful all the time. Mm. You know, I so challenge... So the very imperfection of, of Absolutely. The hardly would you see the extremes on all the sides, right. and I stand to be corrected by uh, my Reverend Father who is here. You know, but what it is is, is, is this, you know, um, the art of lying or the art of coloring the truth to achieve a purpose is innate to man because man is driven by an ambition, by a set of, by, by a set of goal. And that's why you try to bend the truth, even in, if incorrectly, even if right. immorally, to achieve an end. Sure. And it reminds me of propaganda itself. Propaganda, sometimes we want to say propaganda is wrong, that is bad, but it's not absolutely so. Because what is propaganda? It is the art, systematic art of disseminating information whether at the level of entity or at the level of the individual, to achieve a divine set goal. In diplomacy, international relations, there are different kinds of lies. Mm. There are ways in which you can tell it. You do it through words, through communication. That's a good you know, point. But if you want to look at it, you say um, it is a lie. But it is sure. original. It is the, the art, the nature of man. But the thing is this. What is the degree of the truth inherent in what we're, um, in, 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 in what we're saying or what we're putting across? Now, to conclude, um, uh, Charles, you know, have you ever seen, in ordinary terms, at the level of relationship, at the level of romance, have you ever seen a man who tells the wife all the truth, and that wife, will, that whole marriage will remain the same thing? <laughs> you know, always a very difficult well. thing. And in most cases, really, you find it very difficult to see a man who wants to approach a woman for marriage right. and will not inject some lie here and there. Mm. You know, so it's about degree, really. To what extent are you dishonest? To what extent? Extend, are you telling lies, you know? And when we talk about politicians, yes, it's okay to contextualize it, to pigeonhole it into politics, into our politicians. But again, it is through these politicians that you see certain things being achieved. We know some of them don't fulfill promises, but a lot of us also fulfill promises. Mm. And that's why you see development across the world, through um, the, the fireworks of politicians, so to say, even if sometimes they lie, even if sometimes they renege on promises. That's okay. my initial thoughts. Well, I think the three of you have done a, a splendid job of setting this up. Now we'll get into the nitty-gritty, which I, I know what Sesu is looking forward to there. Just stay with us. We're going to take a short break. You're watching The Arise interview. Plenty more still ahead as we continue our chat about the ethics of making and breaking political promises. Stay with us.
we were talking just before we went on break, yeah. just to end up that bit yeah. about the biblical sort of the, the where, where you get the provenance of this whole idea of promises. I think Dr. Denny made that point as well, that Jesus Christ in, in one part of, and I mean, this is not particular to any religion. I'm just quoting yeah, uh, something. It makes the point and emphasizes the principle to his followers that they should let their yes be yes and their no be no. In other words, when you say things, that was, that's what you should do. And when you say things, that, that's what you should mean. Uh, and the notion that you would say, whether you're a politician or anything else, that you're going to do something and just not do it because you found it inconvenient at the time would be a fundamental breach of that principle. Now, I started with the anthropological concept. Mm. Now, to the theological concept, I would like to say that to be a, a religious person, a religious, a religious adherent, to be a Christian, to be a Muslim, you have to be a human being. And well, I'd hope so. Yes. I don't think I've seen any sort of chickens <laughs> or dogs being so, Muslim yeah, or Christian. You have to be a human being. Right. And it is these human beings who are politicians, and a lot of, many of our politicians, they are either Christians and, or Muslims, mm. or any other religion. And as a Christian, you share in the triplex monera. You, once you are baptized, you become a king, you become a priest, and you become a prophet. And in that way, you have accepted God, that God who is spirit and is worshippers, those who worship him, worship him in truth. John chapter 4, verse 24. And in John chapter 8, verse 32, he said, Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. It's only the truth that can send you free. So as a Christian, a, a politician, we expect you to be an ambassador of Christ the King. And that is why the Catholic Bishops' Conference, in almost all the plenaries, they invite the Catholic politicians to remind them, look, you are to represent Christ. Be our ambassador. You know, put into practice all that you have promised. Right. Now, Jesus, you have to be like Jesus and out to Christus. And to be like Jesus, because Jesus is the way and the truth, and their life. Right, okay. No well, clearly they're the not father, like Jesus. <laughs> so, so we're going to move on from there. Let me bring you in, so. Sesu Akume, <laughs> there. Um, just going from that broad perspective to the more particular, I mean, what in your judgment are the promises that matter most in the current political circumstances in Nigeria, for example? The promises that matter most should be promises that are connected with, let's say, <clears throat> excuse me, the most important aspects, which is security and welfare of the citizen. Um, that's what our constitution says. That is the primary um, reason government exists. That section 14 sub 2 says um, security and welfare shall be the primary goal of government. I'm sorry the government has failed in this. Even though promises were made, unfortunately, they have been broken. Mm. And they have been broken, willfully broken. And um, unfortunately, that's where it keeps us, because the promises were made and they have not been kept. It's not as if there's not, there isn't anything that can be done. There are things that could be done, but they have willfully not been done. Right. So this is not a matter of the extent to which someone is lying, like um, Dr. Denny said. By the way, I, I disagree with him. Our yes should be yes, or no should be no, period. And if we fall, if you fail in the, our yes, then we should take responsibility for failing. Right, okay. Well, you, you made that point, yes, and you yes. made it quite stridently yes. earlier. Let me bring Dr. Adeni yes. in, because to, I, I tend to, um, to some extent, see the point that both of you are making. Yes. What I want to ask you is, is it not true that for us humans, there are circumstances where one might think that things have changed so much that one might break a promise in principle. Yeah, absolutely, um, Charles. And that's why I find this subject matter very, very uh, interesting. If you look at the, even in the history of the world, the history mm. of knowledge, and I'm sure um, my panelists here are also um, well schooled enough to um, attest to what I'm saying. You know, 
um, the, the search for truth has been a very difficult thing. It has been, it has been a continuous thing. What mm. is truth really? You know, truth, truth is a differentiated and variegated thing. It's something that is contextual, that can, that can differ from one person to the other, one entity to the Absolutely. other, one culture, you know, completely different. And that's why I was talking about context. That's what I was talking about. How close are you to the truth? You know, and sometimes, really, truth can be very, very It's difficult to say this, but it can actually be very, very dangerous, you know, uh, where you want to stay in the raw form, you want to adhere to it. We have an individual politician in the world today called Donald Trump, president mm -hmm. of the United States of America. Uh, this man is seen as, a, as eccentric, as somebody who is slightly different because he's somebody who um, does not play to the gallery. You know, he hits the nail on the head uh, to the best of his understanding. He doesn't care about whose ox is God. But we see mm. him as somebody who is slightly uh, different. But that's his own understanding. And to the majority of the world, he seems to be um, um, somebody who is, he seems to be a, like an outlier. Okay, because to him, truth uh, is something that he, his own truth is different from the world's mm. truth. His own truth is different from the average American's truth. But it has taken him to the level at which he is at the moment. You know, so truth is actually utopian. It's something we will continue to seek and we probably may not be able to achieve it or uh, to realize it because realizing it means the end of knowledge. Mm. That's, that's the way but I see it. But let me, let me make this right. point very, very quickly again. And I've heard what, uh, what he said. And I also appreciate the fact that Talk, talking from the religious point of view, I related to the fact that Christians go to church on Sunday, Muslims go on Friday, not because they've not, they didn't hear the Quran or the, the Bible being preached to them the previous week, but because they need to be reminded of what the truth is mm. and how to remain holy. So it's a constant challenge of the human being. You know, it's a task that will continue to be done until eternity. You know, so I, I think at I, what point I, are you going to say that we have found the truth? Yes, I think you know, I, I, I'm inclined truth, the to agree is, with you. Is, yeah, the the question right. is that you know, there is a hurdle, but the, you know, it's, it's a, you set the hurdle, but the question is how high do you set that hurdle for your yeah. politicians? Yeah. Clearly in Nigeria, and I'm sure Sassou would no, 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 agree if, with if one, the hurdle is I pretty low. Charles, let me just give a specific right. example to the Nigerian situation. You know, um, I, I'm not, in the history of this country, right, I'm not sure we have had, you, you'd like him or not, I'm not sure we have had a president who you would not see as being um, overly materialistic. You know, because if you ask me to point at his castle that he has built somewhere, mm. I can't find it. You know, but he's been in power for several years. He's had, he has several positions, but I can't find several of his castles. It doesn't make him a perfect person. It doesn't mean it doesn't make him somebody who, who does not have his downside, who doesn't have his failings. Mm. But at the level of integrity, at the level of um, it's an example. As a level of being exemplary, I think he's completely different from the pact that we have had in the past. You know, but at the same time, I'm not saying that it's perfect. I'm not saying that he doesn't have his downside. But in terms of closeness right. to the kind of idea that we are seeking, the kind of truthful leader that we are, that, that we are seeking, I think he has made some effort to be as close as possible to it. Charles. Right. Please let me, let me intervene here. Sure. Once again, I completely disagree with Dr. Denny on all the points he made. In the first place, we cannot have our individual truths. There's some things are white, some are black. Period. There are no two ways between them. I know in life, um, everything is not black and white. There are mm. some gray areas. But um, in many issues, there is black and there is white, period. In, in not, other words, you not, get to not, a point where it is no longer is, just about your own personal judgment. It is judgment. not about the truth you it's created gone beyond for yourself, sort of indeed. That, yes. So some things are white, some are black. Right. For instance, Donald Trump cannot sit down and create his own truths and live in them and lead people to war. Mm. He cannot do that. And then we cannot sit down here and justify when lives are being killed because somebody's being philosophical about what is true or false. Donald Trump lied that the US forces were supposed to be in Syria for 30 days. That is a lie. Because when we went to Syria in the first place, there was no timeline. Mm. He has pulled out from Syria. From Syria, It's going to kill people. It's going to- It's already uh, killing uh, Indeed, it's already killing people. It's going mm. to do much worse. It's, or, it's, it's devastating the relations the US mm. has with, with, um, with the Kurds and with their allies and their allies elsewhere. Donald Trump is telling lies every day. I stopped counting when I noted that he had told his 10,000th lie. For goodness sake. So we cannot say that I like so, that. someone told well, that's lies. More than me. We, we cannot say that someone told lies and because they became president, right. then their lies took them to where they are. Mm. That's a, a press, a, that's a recipe for destroying our society. That should never be acceptable. 
The other example about the, the person he spoke about, the fact that he didn't see his mansions elsewhere doesn't mean he doesn't exist. Right, okay, let me ask you to just hold that thought. Yeah. Yes, we'll please. finish it in a minute <laughs> yes, because yes, we've please. got to take a break. Oh. Charles and Yigolu now. Nigerian politicians have been consistently criticized for making promises they never keep and for being disconnected and not understanding what Nigerians living in the real world are all about. Why is it, though, that politicians don't seem to get it about the lives of the people who vote them in? And are things any different today under President Buhari than they were, say, five or ten years ago, as far as the politicians' inability to connect with the people is concerned? Or are today's politicians just as disconnected from the people they're supposed to represent as they were a decade ago? We'll take a listen here to President Buhari recently promising to lift 100 million Nigerians out of poverty in 10 years' time. This test is by no means unattainable. China has done it. India has done it. Indonesia has done it. Nigeria can do it. <clears throat> These are all countries characterized by huge burdens of population. China and Indonesia succeeded under authoritarian regimes. India succeeded in a democratic setting. We can do it. With leadership and sense of purpose, we can lift 100 million Nigerians out of poverty in 10 years. President Buhari there with me in the studio to continue our discussion around the making and breaking of political promises. Father Cornelius Afebu Omonokua, the Executive Secretary of the Nigeria Interreligious Council and former Director of Mission and Dialogue at the Catholic Secretariat of Nigeria. Sesu Akume, a public policy analyst and spokesman for the Abundant Nigeria Renewal Party, under which he ran for a seat as a House of Representatives candidate in 2019. And Dr. Abiodun Adeni, a political affairs analyst analyst and lecturer at Bayes University in Abuja. And uh, Father Cornelius, I'll come straight away to you. We had President Buhari there. Let's focus for a moment on his promise to lift 100 million Nigerians out of poverty in 10 years' time, come what may. What compelling circumstances do you think would make it all right for him to opt out of that promise because of course not only would that leave him in a very awkward situation to say the least it would also leave those hundred million people still mired in poverty uh, if you don't mind let me give you a background on saturday i traveled to auchi auchi is in the midwest of that's nigeria auchi is edo state right that's in the midwest part of nigeria. we've got a global audience see. so we have to put these things we have to pay way. children children were collecting money from us right to take us through the bush parts we come up from the road to obajana instead of going through okene we pass through obajana to kaba down to okene from there we now very off because we could not pass through okene and that's because the road was bad. The road, I'm okay, because we don't know the geography of the place. We're, we're just trying to. So we just, right. at the end of the day, a journey of four hours right. took us close to 14 hours. Then on Monday, coming back, we couldn't pass through Gara. We had to manage that road. Then I remember that somebody said once upon a time that in any responsible government, can provide lights right. and road to the nation in three months. Not just three years, I think three months. And who is this person then? Uh, is the present <laughs> person who is in charge of these roads we right. are talking about. So you would think that his so, the, the focus is to start with things like those roads rather than yes. 100 million people so, out of poverty, because this is yeah, something you can do we, right away. Sort yeah. of thing. What I'm bringing this out is the president is one person. Hmm. It's, an, it's an executive, right? But people have different portfolios. Somebody is, in, is responsible for roads. Somebody is responsible for lights. Somebody is re responsible for education. Right. By the grace of God, I am right now, my office is in the Federal Secretariat. And I discovered that, like Shakespeare would say, 
The problem is not in our stars, but in ourselves that we are underlay. So, but because when we build the whole thing on President Buhari alone, we can miss the focus. Sure. Because each of us needs to do our own bits to make Nigeria better. It is not just all about breaking promises. Even the security, the security, the those who are supposed to the get man, Nigeria is you know corrupt to the down, you know right to, to, to the depth. So and what is the reason? For, in, in, the, the amenities are not there. There is so much poverty. So I think that. Yeah, but I, I think the central issue here yes. is that we're aware of the fact, of, just of a minute, that there is I'm coming back to what, what we're saying is, because we haven't got all that, you know, all the time mm, in the yes, world. Yes, I mean, yes. the, the, the point is that if we are aware, which we clearly are, yes. of the problems, mm. we need people to offer solutions indeed. and to carry out those yes, solutions. Indeed. That's really the key point. So I'm going to bring Sesu Akume in here because well, let me just in the case of, well, okay, just very briefly because we're, we're running out of time. What I am we, we, saying, we can't actually just have one person sort of dominate. We course. need to. We, there's something we should use, the accountability. Right. Let us hold all the ministers, the senators, those who are responsible for our country, let us hold them responsible because it is not the president that is the judiciary. Can the judiciary, in truth, deliver right. justice? Okay, well, let me bring Sesu Akume in. In the case of Nigerian politicians and their promises, because I want to bring us back to oh, the path, um, repeated promises, as Father pointed out, to provide uninterrupted electricity supply, for instance, or fix roads or tackle corruption and insecurity. Should the hurdle be considered to be extra high or in the context of Nigeria and the massive poverty that he talked about, should that hurdle be brought a bit lower? No, it shouldn't be brought a bit lower. It actually should be taken about a bit higher. Well, living the crisis situation, I, I, I think many of us don't understand what we're in, right in. Yeah, but isn't that crisis situation also inherited by the government that comes that's in? The point, in? That's, that's because, the point. That's because, the point I'm about to make. I mean, you know, it, you, the guy can't wave a magic wand and it's fix not, all the it's roads not in about Nigeria. Nigeria. It's, it's, not take about, time. it's not about waving a magic right. wand. It's about capacity. It's about competence. It's about character. Um, unfortunately, Buhari has none of those. With due respect, he has none of those. I don't agree with the... the well, it's not just him, no, as Father it, pointed out. It's also other that's, politicians. That's part of where I, mean, I disagree the with the police. Class. That's where I disagree with, with, right, okay. with Father, because we cannot just be talking generally. We're talking about someone who made a promise mm. and failed to deliver on the promise. If we're talking about a minister of works who is in charge of roads, who appointed him? And I don't know the Minister of Works because I didn't appoint him. Mm. He's not the President of Nigeria. He doesn't owe me anything. He answers to someone. So if I have a problem with the roads, I talk to the person he answers to. That's the way it goes. If we're talking about security, the IG of police who appoints him, am I the one who appoints him? Somebody appoints him. We have an insecurity challenge in Nigeria, problem in Nigeria, not even a challenge. In, Buhari set up a committee. The King Bay Committee, we submitted a report in December 2017 and spelled out one, two, three, four, five things to do to fix the security apparatus in Nigeria. That was December 2017. One, it has not been published, mm. neither has it been implemented. So when we just talk generally, it lies on somebody's desk. When Buhari was running for president, nobody asked him. He himself committed to publicly declare his assets. Has he publicly declared his, his assets? No, he has not. He did not publicly declare his assets. What they did was that they, they, he simply filed at the Code of Conduct Bureau and said he had fulfilled his promise. That was a lie. He did not fulfill the promise. When there was intense pressure, he simply said, well, he had under 30 right. million naira on the, in his account. That's all. All the houses he has, he has never told anybody where they are. But by the way, Musa Yaradua, Sheikh Musa Yaradua, I'm sorry, Umaru Musa Yaradua did not promise to declare his assets, but when he became president, he actually did. Right. Many of those things are not so difficult and so impossible. Okay. When Buhari said he was going to shrink the presidential air fleet to bare minimum, in fact, he said he was going to be flying commercial. Has he done that? These are things that can be done sure. one, two, three things. Okay. When let, you talk about let, lifting 100 million, one second, please. Right. When you talk about lifting 100 million people out of poverty, for goodness sake, in the past four years, more and more people have fallen into poverty. Mm. So what, what's the okay, point let, let me bring Dr. Denny in, because we, we've got a couple of minutes before we have to take a, a break. I mean, what is your take 
on that, uh, Dr. Adeniyi. Do these election promises trump almost everything? And the need to keep those promises is absolutely critical, a critical part of the covenant between the voters and the politicians. Well, for me, I like to look at the light at the end of the tunnel. You know, I, I like to look at the bright side of things. Mm. I want to be optimistic about political promises. And sometimes I even want to think that to use the word break is rather tending towards the extreme to say that they break promises, you know. And I want to believe that, you know, the average politician, you know, um, is a sincere person, okay? That the average politician is a sincere person. Um, it doesn't matter that at some point it becomes impossible for them to fulfill some, some of their promises. Government is a very complex thing. I've been in government before. I know government is complex. Government is complicated. Sometimes you say you will do A, and by the time you get there, you discover that you cannot actually do A. You now tend towards B. You know, even when you are trying um, to come as close as possible to A, but you realize that it's, it's impossible. You know, that's why earlier on I talked about the ideation and reality about theory and practice, you know. It's very easy for us to idealize, for us to uh, conceptualize ideas, you know, uh, saying somebody has not done this, somebody has not done that, you know, but somebody, um, the book is stopping somewhere, and the reality is there, they see the reality better than we are doing it. This is not necessarily speaking for them, but I, I do know, like I keep saying, that they have their downsides, you know, but uh, to a very large extent, most of the time, when they make promises, these uh, so-called promises they are talking about, you know, they are probably setting a benchmark. They are probably setting a program, a plan of action for themselves. Some of them might tend towards propaganda. Some of them might just be um, promises, you know, to sweet tongue the populace. Some of them are actually like that, but some of them are also very, very sincere. You know, then we we'll, we'll see, we can see through the ones that are insincere, and we can as well deserve between. Those, and do you consider those that, those are, that are insincere to be in the majority? Because, I mean, if you look at the way yeah. Nigeria has developed or not developed not over the developed. last few years, not I mean, surely anybody in their right mind, anybody mm -hmm. who makes any comparison with a lot of other African countries mm -hmm. that have been through traumatic periods of I think it's military been, rule and all that, will see it, that, you know, there's a, <laughs> things are not it, moving it, in It this reminds country. me of the quality of the leaders we've had in the, since independence, you know. It takes me to the quality of leaders we have had successive leadership, particularly the military ones. And we are still yet to recover from military rule, even 20 years after oh unbroken okay. democracy. I think we you have a good point. Let, let's yes, take a break. Right. Topic today revolves around a question that many people around the world regularly ask themselves. Should politicians make promises they can't keep? It is a question that throws up ethical issues because there is a morality to promise making and breaking. Of course, let's not forget that whether it is Nigeria, somewhere in Europe, Asia or America, politicians' promises about what they'll do when they are elected are routinely broken. And so perhaps we should give a wide berth to those promises, recognizing that some people will say anything they like to get into power but may not be able to deliver. And that's just a fact of life. With me in the studio to continue our discussion around the making and breaking of political promises, Father Cornelius Afebu Omonakua, the Executive Secretary of the Nigeria Interreligious Council and former Director of Mission and Dialogue at the Catholic Secretariat of Nigeria, Sesu Akume, a public policy analyst and spokesman for the Abundance Nigeria Renewal Party, under which he ran for a seat as a House of Representatives candidate in 2019, and Dr. Abiodun Adeni, a political affairs analyst and lecturer at Bayes University in Abuja. Thank you, gentlemen, for staying with me and for giving us an absolutely brilliant discussion here. Father Cornelius, in a sense, I'm just listening, coming from the back of what Sesu Akume was saying, um, those promises that politicians make and the fidelity to them is what both moral and political life is all about. And therefore, the bar, what Sassou was saying, needs to be set pretty high for promise breaking. Okay. Well, I want to, you know, I was talking about, mm. you know, I didn't want to have a focus on the president. I have my reasons. Yeah, no, of course. You see... Well, it's not just the president, I mean... No, it's not know, because it's the president. Yeah. Somebody, I was renovating my office in the fed, federal secretariat. Somebody came in and said, ah, ah, father, you don't work for government like this. The government give you 10 million. Use 1 million to work for them and keep the 9 million. 
Because I am thinking that a lot of the things we suffer in this country is because of so much embezzlement, greed. Mm. I'm sure you must have heard of one of the, the man in charge of pensioners who was arrested. When I was in the Catholic Secretariat, it was alleged that the hotel near our secretariat, he bought it. This uh, pensioners would come every time to come and do accreditation to do this and that. But this man was keeping their money in the bank. It was released by government. Sometimes too, government release, uh, releases money for the project that this project is made for. But someone, somebody will put this money in his pocket. So there's, a, there's almost you know, a wicked element yes. to it. Yes. So I think <laughs> what the reason be, is that I mean, many of us, many, many, not just politicians, many people have forgotten eschatology, mm. the four last things. Mm. They forget that they will die. They forget that when they die, they will either go to heaven or to hell. And that when they die, that they have a legacy, they have a name that they should leave behind. So that when their children turn their face to somewhere, they will say, oh, because of your father, I am what I am today. Many of our people don't think about that. So you should know that you have a name to, 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 to protect. Mm. You should know you want to leave behind a legacy. You want to protect, you know, you want your children to have a place to turn to. Then you have to do the right thing. So because this whole thing is not just about politicians, politicians. People civil servant. Yeah, no, what I you, understand that. Yes, because but what I, do you I, think, I, I'm coming. Sure. What do you think of a lecturer who would not pass a student if he doesn't bring money or a girl? Yeah, no, absolutely. So, you know, what there, there's that? no question that so there is an element to, of... So to, for us to make Nigeria better, we have to start with, you know, a kind of mental re-engineering. Right. We so, so, so Sue, let, let me bring you in there, because from what Father is saying, it clearly suggests that a great deal about political and public life in Nigeria is about not telling the truth. In other words, we, we go and say to people, this is what I'm going to do for you, when I know I'm not going to do it. Indeed. So the issue here is this. Mm. I am focusing this conversation on what we're discussing. We're not speaking generally about our society. Mm. We're talking about public politicians or public seekers making promises that they break. Is mm. there a morality or amorality to Absolutely. it? That's where the focus is. And I'm narrowing it down, for instance, to the president, not because it is Buhari, but because it's the president. The president is not a person. Tomorrow, Buhari won't be the pre president, mm. but there will be a president. The president sets the tone for a country. So, and then the elected officials also set the tone for the society. So when you have people at, ahead, when you have leadership that is corrupt, that is not sincere, that is not honest, what do you think the followers are going to do? When you talk about, let's say, give you 10 million naira and somebody takes 1 million naira and the rest, where did they learn it from? Mm. They didn't just learn it from themselves. In societies that function, it's not just about God, because Nigeria is the, one of the most religious countries in the world. As a matter of fact, I saw a statistic that said 95% of people polled in Nigeria pray every day. Mm -hmm. Incidentally, Nigeria is one of the poorest countries with the largest number of poor people, the most disorganized country. When you look at the poll, the people who pray less, who are less religious, seem to be more upright. Mm -hmm. So for, for once, I want to step away from the religious thing. Oh, and no, absolutely. Let's, let's face the yes. issue here. Absolutely. Let's face the issue here. So when, in those kind of societies, they have leaders who model the right thing. They also have the law that makes sure, makes sure that if you break the law, there are going to be consequences. Mm. There are no consequences for breaking the law in Nigeria. And the other one is you have institutions that make sure that you do it. So sometimes mm. people do the right thing, not because they are good people, mm. but because the law is going to catch up with them or the institution is going to catch up with them. When you talk about Mena who stole pension funds, the same Mena came back into Nigeria, the same person who was wanted, was going everywhere with our security forces, was actually promoted promoted in our civil service, actually resumed for duty, and yet nobody saw him, and he walked out of Nigeria, and then we're saying that we're fighting corruption, and then we say that we don't want corruption incentivized, we're already incentivizing it. Mm. So right now, I think I would take the EQ and say that it is best for me to be corrupt, and I can always survive in it, because I took cue from someone who made sure. a promise that he's going to fight corruption, but never did, rather incentivized it. I can give lots of examples okay, of incentivizing corruption. Let so let me bring, when people live their life, they're only learning from sure. where they the, the, from the We've leader. got a few minutes left to the end of yeah. the program. Dr. Adeni, um, yeah. just going back to the point you were making, Absolutely. which was which you know, trying to sort of create the, the philosophical boundaries for yeah. this discussion, is it very difficult to distinguish between a genuine promise made in good faith 
and promises made where you know you cannot keep them? Because I think that was a point you were trying Absolutely. to make and earlier. That's an excellent um, um, deduction, uh, Charles. You know, I think the, it just brings us to the question of communication, really. Mm. You know, how do leaders communicate? You know, and communication, of course, we know is a very important element um, in governance. And it helps a, gov a government if it actually wants to be defined as a very good government, you know. Um, how much of communication are we having from our leaders? You know, overall, I would say it is still, um, they communicate less. They communicate less than they are supposed to be doing because they have this understanding. And sometimes you may not really blame them. They have this understanding that, you know, it's, communication should be on the need to know basis. But we're in the new world of revolution in communication, where if you do not feed the populace mm. with information, something I mean, they will, they will provide information for you. You know, and you have to be bothered at the end of the day by reacting. You know, that's the problem that we're having with some of our, our government officials, really. So we need more communication. Communications can, can get so many things correctly. Look at Donald Trump, for instance. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not a fan of Donald Trump, mm. but he said he's going to do quite a number of outrageous things, quite a number of things that a lot of people thought were, were outrageous. You know, but we knew ordinarily, the Americans knew it, that it was going to be very difficult for him to achieve it, like building a wall and all of that. But the man came in and he started walking towards fulfilling some of these uh, promises, as outrageous as some of them were. If not for the cause, some of these things would have been executed mm. by this same person. But he kept communicating. He kept the populace abreast of what he was doing. Yes, you may say that he was using Twitter wrongly, but of course, he kept you know, um, providing information into the, info into the space. You know. That's what we're still lacking around here. We need more of information, you know, more facts, more messaging. The messaging mm. process has to be increased so that we'll, I mean, we'll be informed, you know, and we can understand better, better with them if they actually want us to, um, to understand with them. But I don't want to think that um, some of these promises are deliberately made because they know that it's going to be false at the end of the day. You know, um, I don't think, I don't want to be fatalistic or to think that it's all Anu's horribilities with um, their promises. They do not want to fulfill it in the first instance. No, I don't want to think so. I just believe that there must be some, that there's an S factor somewhere that is preventing them from, um, from fulfilling some of these promises. Right. Okay. Yeah, but, so, they do, but, but they do but, know that if they, if they do not sweet tongue the populace, of course they will not, they're not going to get there in the first instance. Right. No, I understand that. But yeah. just we, we've got about a minute or so, so you need to sort of trim, trim less than a minute, trim your answer there. Mm -hmm. um, just coming on, on the back of what he's saying, clearly there, there, there are questions about competing truths and what are the right sort of promises to make. In, in other words, do Nigerian politicians need other ways to engage the populace over such sort of issues that are, that are simply not binary? And I've just been told that the time is out, and I'm really sorry. <laughs> I would have loved to have you answer that question. But uh, Father Cornelius Afebu Omanakua, Sesu Akume, and Dr. Abiodun Adeni, thank you very much indeed. My Apologies pleasure, thanks. once yeah, again. Yeah. That's it for this edition of the Arise interview. Join us again for a fresh edition tomorrow. From me and the entire team here in Abuja, bye-bye, and thank you for watching.